So when you stop to think about integrated hypocrisy, it's really a bifurcated condition. And, and in a way, it's going to be really easy to understand that when you stop to think about why people are hypocritical in the first place. What we call being polite is really hypocrisy. You're taught from very early age that when you're in a group of other people that you have to adopt a certain set of behaviors in spite of how you really think or feel. That's called fitting in. That's called being polite. That's called proper behavior. And it's pitched and sold with the idea that, you know what, people and you are going to have disagreements and what you don't want to do is cause trouble by airing those disagreements. You want to find, as it were, a middle ground and have converse in that middle ground. And we're all taught that. I mean, you know, America has its own culture and mores and ways of, of saying what constitutes proper behavior in a society. You know, Germany has its own culture, and there's a lot of similarities between the two. Um, China has its own culture, which is very much more um, oriented to this kind of thinking. The whole, the whole of the East, primarily because there's so many more people, everybody jostling together. You know, the population density is so much greater. India, the same thing. And, you know, frankness is almost always, in all the cultures I can think of, throughout history, frankness is something to be avoided. It's yearned for, but it's something to be avoided. In the name of getting along with other people, in the name of having converse, despite the fact that you all have, you know, different opinions on things. Now, of course, carried to its extreme, you've got the psychophant who's just always saying how somebody else oh you're so right oh you're so good blah, 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 blah. and we got psychophants in every culture and especially in government if you have any kind of popularity at all you will have your own as it were groupies psychophants people who are always telling you how good you are and you're a real fool if you listen to them are they lying to you? No. They actually are honest. In their mind, that's you. But in their mind, the person they think is you is not the real you. They idolize you. That's, you know, a kind of hypocrisy too. Because the one that they're praising is not the real you, but someone they make up as being you. And that's what we all do with respect to God. But it's even deeper than that. The point of it is that there is an inability or an unwillingness, usually a combination of the two, to face whatever the truth actually is. So we have to come up with some kind of cover. Something to make the medicine go down more easily. Because in our mind, whatever the truth is, it's not, it's not something we want to know. We have to sugar it. We're constantly sugaring God. And, you know, you sugar something when you are not able to take it unsugared. It's like coffee. There are a whole lot of people who just cannot drink coffee black. It's black straight out of the pot with no additional flavoring of any kind. Some of them can, but they have to really dilute it first. See, it's the taste of a thing. We can't take it if it doesn't taste good. That's the important thing to say. We can't take it if it doesn't taste good. So if 
the truth about God doesn't taste good to us, we're either going to reject it outright, or we're going to sugar it or manipulate it or slice it and dice it in some way. Now, there's a really, truly obvious thought process we all have in us to prove this. And it's the very essence of the sin nature. So if you want proof of original sin, you don't have to look any farther than your own soul. Now watch this. Ever since you were little, somebody somewhere at some time has taught you somewhere along the way that X is good. But when you do X, what are you thinking? I am good if I do X. The truth is, well, the alleged truth is, X is what's good. Not you. Just X. You know, eat your peas. Peas are good for you. Peas was a big thing in American tables in the 1950s. Pick whatever other, other vegetable your culture endorses. You know, green peas have a lot of vitamin C and some a, vitamin A in them and certain other things that are deemed good. They're not the, you know, most nutritious of vegetables, but, you know, they were on a lot of American tables. So when you were growing up in 1950s America, you were told to eat your peas and carrots because they are good for you. But when you ate them, you told yourself you are good for eating them. You reversed it. That's the same nature. That's what it does. It's good to love your fellow man. Everybody says that. But when you do it, you say, oh, I am good because I love my fellow man. So what you're doing is you're, it's so quick and so natural for us to do this reversal, this hypocritical reversal. And why is it hypocritical? Because if it is good, you are denying the fact that it is good when you say, I am good if I do this thing that's good. What you're saying is that the thing you do is no good except to make you good. So you are reversing the very statement. X is good. What, X must be bad because it's only worth doing if it makes you good. I am good if I do X. We don't even know. That we've reversed the truth. We don't even know. How many kids are taught from childhood, Johnny be good. And is what makes Johnny good? If he does what's deemed a good thing. But if Johnny is good by doing what's deemed a good thing, then the thing that's called good is no longer good. Because its goodness is to make Johnny good. You see the point? Oh, I love mankind, therefore I'm good. So I guess then loving mankind doesn't mean anything. And it really doesn't. People pride themselves on how charitable they are. Pride themselves. Well then I guess the charity that you're giving isn't any good at all because its purpose is to make you be proud of yourself. Do you say that about your favorite food? No, you feel guilty if you enjoy it. Let's pretend you just love steak or peanut butter or chocolate pie. You don't sit there and tell yourself how good you are when you eat your favorite food. What you're thinking of is it, how good it is. Oh, this pie tastes so good. Oh, I love this steak. Mm -hmm. oh, this pie, this steak, this chili paste. Oh, it's so good. See, now you are that's a truth. It's relative to your taste, of course, but it's still a truth about it, not you. 
You don't have to denude it of its value to call yourself a good person. Why? Because you like it. You love the way that steak tastes. So then it is good. But if you don't love the way it tastes and you eat it, you tell yourself how good you are that you eat it. So when somebody says, oh, I love my fellow man, I'm a good person, then they're telling you they don't love their fellow man. Because they don't say that about the foods they like. They talk about how good those foods are. So if you really loved mankind, you'd be going about on and on about how great mankind is, and you wouldn't be thinking about how good you are. Just like you're not thinking about how good you are when you eat your favorite food. Honey, when I eat peanut butter, I'm thinking about how good it is. I'm not thinking about how good I am. If anything of an attitude I have toward myself, I feel guilty because it feels so good and tastes so good to eat that peanut butter. See the difference? See, I don't have to sugar up or butter up or soften up or change the taste of peanut butter to justify eating it. I love it. So I don't have to compensate myself for its taste by telling myself how good I am if I eat it. But if I didn't like it, eat your peas and carrots, brain out. Oh, I'm a good person if I eat my peas and carrots. I'm a good person if I do a good deed. I'm a good person if I love God. So what are you saying? You don't love God, you don't love doing a good deed, and you don't like the peas and carrots. See how hypocritical that is? And we lie to ourselves with impunity. I am a good person if I take out the trash, which means, translated, Boy, I really hate taking out the trash, but boy, it's going to win me brownie points, so I'm going to do it. So taking out the trash is not something valued. Getting brownie points is valued, so that's why you do it. It's really important to understand this, because our hypocrisy is entirely, entirely, uh, what do you want to call it, on parade. With respect to all of our so-called beliefs about God. We go to church on Sunday in our best clothes. Why do you have to get dressed up at all? Why on Sunday? Oh, it's tradition. So who cares? If it's tradition and you're doing it for tradition, if you're getting dressed up in your best clothes because you're going to be seen by other people, what does that have to do with God? See the point? There are a whole bunch of things that we slap on and say God wants or this is, you know, holy or good or obedience to God. God doesn't have anything to do with it. What, what was that? This people honors me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. And threw that at me while I was talking. I forget where that is in the Bible. My computers are off right now. That's hypocrisy. And look how we don't know. And look how... How are we going to know? We are incapable of knowing how bad and how hypocritical and what liars we are. Because from the very beginning... When you're a child, your mommy and your daddy tells you that you are good if you do this so-called good thing. So you're motivated from the cradle, especially with respect to things you don't like and don't value, to do things in order to call yourself good. Gee, uh, where have you heard that before? Woman in the garden, if you eat this piece of fruit, you'll be as smart as God. Yeah, right. That's integrated hypocrisy, and it begins in the cradle. So no wonder we don't net recognize how hypocritical we are. But we are. And sooner or later, it spills out into everything we do. 
If you're busy running your life based on, I got to do this thing to think of myself as a good person, you're going to get tired of that for one thing. And for another thing, um, how do you want to call it? If you're doing something in order to be a good person, then if you did that thing and you think you're there for a good person, you're going to still need to be compensated for the thing you did that you don't value. Because if you're a good person and nobody else is telling you, oh, what a great person you are, or even if they are telling you you're great, but that's all, then you're going to feel slighted. After all I did for you, I did this good deed, and I'm not getting anything for it. But I'm a good person, so somebody should pay me. And we come to think that that's what God should do. See how easily we slip into this thing? So many deconversion stories by atheists. This is what the story is. I expect, I was a good person, I followed the Bible, I learned the Bible, my parents taught me, I believed in it, and then I asked God for something and He didn't give it to me. My mother, my brother, my father, my sister died or got sick. Or I prayed to God for something and I didn't get it. So, therefore, there is no God. Really? If a hypocrite wants something from you, do you give in? But if a hypocrite doesn't know he's a hypocrite, even though the behavior is very clearly hypocritical, then the hypocrite's going to be, you know, all ticked off. You didn't give me what I wanted and I worked for it. Yeah, because you set up the straw man in the first place telling yourself how good you were to do something that maybe itself was intrinsically good, but not in your mind. So you didn't really appreciate what you did. You thought it was only good in order to get you some kind of praise or money or something else from somebody else. So, of course, you're going to think that way toward God, too. And guess what? He's not going to give in to that. So now you're going to be all cattywampus and, oh, there's no God. And I'm not trying to single out atheists. We Christians are just as bad. The Jews are just as bad. We're all this way. I was disappointed. And we won't necessarily admit that to ourselves. We might play the, the blame game in the opposite direction and blame ourselves. Oh, I only lit two candles. I should have lit three. I only counted four beads. I should have counted ten. I ate a piece of pork on Friday. So uh, God didn't answer my prayer because I ate this piece of pork on Friday. Seriously. Could you insult God more than that? Is he going to care whether you violated your own standard about eating pork? And people will turn around and say, But the prohibition against eating pork was in the Mosaic Law. Yeah, and did you ever ask why? No, because you didn't care what the book actually says to find out why it's there. You just counted yourself, I'm a good person if I don't eat pork. No, you're a more healthy person if you don't eat pork. In those days, the caring of slaughtered animals was not too good. And certain kind of animals, they get, you know, germs faster. Pig in particular. Big delicacy amongst the pagans. The Romans were real big on pig sacrifice for one thing, so were the Greeks. And they weren't too cleanly. So it just so happened that, you know, in order to do the whole Mosaic Law being a satire anyhow against religion. The whole Mosaic Law is a satire on religion. Of course, you'd have to actually analyze it to re figure that out. So God says, no, you can't eat pork. But, you know, there's a dietary reason for that. 
because the pork gets sicker sooner. They had all these laws about how you cut the animal and how you clean the animal and all this other stuff. Yeah, in order to keep it cleaner longer so you wouldn't get sick if you ate it. Same is true now. But you know, there are Seventh-day Adventists. I don't know if they still hold to this, and I don't know if it's a particular sect. But I remember Seventh-day Adventists telling me, Oh, you better not eat pork. Like, you know, you're Satan if you eat pork. And some groups in Judaism think that too, because they don't understand why the prohibition was in the law in the first place. Because they don't want to know why. They want to pat themselves on the back for not eating pork. Now, I remember thinking when the Southern Day Adventists were telling me, you know, because I come from a Jewish background, okay. I don't particularly like the taste of pork. I mean, sometimes, but most of the time, no. But I remember thinking to the, the Seventh Day Adventists, but I don't think I ever said anything to them. It's like, okay, God is so petty, he's going to make an issue out of what kind of meat you eat. And one kind of meat is more spiritual than another kind of meat? I don't think that's what he meant by the prohibition. Of course he didn't. Every prohibition or other rule in the Bible, you have to look beneath the rule to find the doctrine that's being, what do you want to call it? Illustrated by the rule. But if all you want to do is tell yourself how good you are by obeying the rule... And honey, that's not restricted to Bible stuff. We're always like that. Well, then you won't know why the rule is there. And therefore, carrying out the rule is hypocritical. See the point? In the 1800s and the 1900s, hypocrisy was really important. You bowed and you stood and you said certain things in society and blah de blah de blah de blah and everybody obeyed those rules. There was a lot of virtue in society in those days too. But the hypocrisy was overwhelming. How do you do, Mrs. McGillicuddy? Oh, I'm just fine. Mrs. McGillicuddy is not just fine. But she has to say that because that's expected. And that's how we treated all of our, our studying of Bible too. You showed up at, you know, on Epiphany or whatever, Whit Sunday or whatever day it was, whether you were Anglican or Catholic, it hardly mattered. And if you didn't show up, well, the gossips would talk about the fact that you weren't in church today. But everybody bought into the same hypocrisy. Now you know why. We're all busy telling ourselves if we do certain activities, X, Y, Z. It doesn't matter that the activity has no intrinsic value or whether it does have intrinsic value. We tell ourselves, I will be a good person if I do that. Which therefore automatically demeans whatever you're doing. Because its purpose is therefore to make you good. Same lie told to the woman in the garden. Well then, the thing can be as dumb as a stump. Counting beads. I'm a good person if I count beads. I'm a good person if I say five Hail Marys. I'm a good person if I bob in from the wailing wall. I'm a good person if I pour liquid butter on a wooden statue. It doesn't matter that it doesn't make any sense what you're doing. And it doesn't matter if it has intrinsic value either. Notice the inability to understand the validity of the thing you're doing that's supposed to make you good. We're not paying any attention to the actual intrinsic value of the activity. Clearly. Because if you were paying attention, you would say, why? What am I going to bob in front of the wailing wall for? Well, God's going to grant me more, more holiness if I bob. 
And I wear the little prayer, for, prayer shawl with the tits it. And the little P.S. Oh, he's going to care about whether I have curls dangling down the side of my face. No. God isn't petty. Hello. And if you think about that activity, then you're not going to do it anymore. Because you're thinking, I'm wasting God's time in my own. Yeah, you are. God doesn't need you bobbing in front of the wailing wall. Your prayer isn't going to go any higher than, than, you know, your top hat. Well, what about the guy who's pouring liquid butter that's very expensive? That could have been used to feed your family on a wooden statue. Does a wooden statue need the butter? Can it drink the butter? Yes, the butter will soak in, but it's a wooden statue. That's about 10 feet high, by the way. Very popular Hindu practice. You would think those people would wake up and smell the coffee sometime. Oh, no. What about counting beads? Or stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down. Or wearing pointy hats and pointy shoes like the Catholics do. And that's supposed to be more holy because why? Huh? See, if you halfway think about the things that are pitched to you as making you good if you do them, you realize that you're really just a fool. Absolute fool. But the people who do those things, they're not even thinking about the, the, the intrinsic value of the claim. So then also when a claim, this is a kicker, also when a claim comes along that does have intrinsic value, you're not going to think about its intrinsic value. All you're going to think about is whether or not it makes you a good person. You're so used to addicted to the need to turn whatever it is you do into something that makes you good that you end up demeaning everything so now look there is indeed an intrinsic value in learning God it's tasty to know God it's enjoyable you don't have to worry about it. It's not even relevant. Who cares what you are? He's gorgeous. It's tasty to eat your favorite food. It's tasty to know God. Taste the Lord for he is good. Thank you, Dad. I didn't remember where that first was. It's in Psalms and David said it and it's a refrain. Taste the Lord for he is good. Taste. Like food. You're benefiting and enjoying the taste. Truth tastes good to God. Truth be free tastes good to God. Honey, it doesn't taste good to us. We have to doctor it somehow. And when we can't doctor it enough, we have to tell ourselves that that I'm a good person if I do this. So it doesn't taste good to us, the truth that, yes, you should love your fellow man. It tastes good to God. And the more you know God and the more you become like him in your thinking, the more it really does taste good to you. The more you really are interested in people. But if you're, you don't know him then he doesn't taste good to you. And if he doesn't taste good to you, truth doesn't taste good to you. And everything you do is motivated by whether or not it's going to make you good in your mind. Which doesn't have to have any sense at all. Which you're not even going to bother to analyze whether it has intrinsic value of its own at all. Because its purpose is to make you good. And you can't admit of anything else being good for itself if it's supposed to make you good it's supposed to be your slave therefore it can't be good on its own it's only good for making you good and so whatever the hoi polloi whatever the masses say is good you're going to say that's what you are too in order to claim yourself as good and deserving something from them 
So what, what kind of soul results? Hypocritical. Incapable of analyzing intrinsic value. Dying in that condition. Maybe saved. All I had to do is once believe Christ paid for your sins. And pretty much anybody who's ever heard the gospel probably believed it at least once in their lives. Because heck, what? why not? So heaven might be a really, really big place. But filled with what? Is souls. Hypocrites. Who for the first time when they're dead... There's a whole new rethinking process that has to go on. And the ability to discern intrinsics was never developed. The ability to know God was never developed. The ability to actually enjoy life and actually love people was also never developed because you had to spend your whole life on the hamster wheel of trying to be a good person. But at least you're in heaven. That's how integrated hypocrisy ends. And the good news is, and this is what I have to learn from them the most, the good news is, is that once these people are dead, then the hypocrisy is gone. The inability to think remains. But the hypocrisy is gone because old sin nature urge to be good is gone. And you kind of like start over. But because the inability to think remains, the processing of daily information is restricted. The soul size is really small. But they'll be happy. Growing, I'm guessing, growing still. My pastor thinks you don't grow after you die. But he was guessing too when he was trying to figure that out. I'm guessing the opposite. That yes, growth continues kind of like the difference between having a $100 bank account and a million dollar bank account. You can still get interest on $100, but it's very small. You can still get interest on a million dollars, but of course it's much bigger. Bible doctrine is your bank account. How much do you enter heaven with? That's why getting Bible doctrine is called true riches by Christ. Thank you, Dan. Get as much as you can down here. For the purpose of enjoying life. And you know what's so horrible about all this? Is in the beginning stages when you get Bible doctrine, you will tell yourself how good you are that you get it because you don't appreciate it. When the day comes that you start realizing, oh wow, I shouldn't be allowed to have this or know this or see this. This doctrine is so gorgeous. And you start feeling guilty because you like it so much. That's when you're actually on your way. Preview of coming attractions. Peace out.